Sounds good. Hello, good evening. Welcome to the Royal Photographic Society's historical group and this latest in the series of collection talks. It's a real pleasure this evening to introduce Claire Mayo, who's the archive and library manager at the National Science and Media Museum collections in Bradford. Um, we were just saying a few minutes ago, actually, sometimes we forget how important Bradford is to the photographic community. There are still rather wonderful collections there. So we, we're going to hear from Claire about some of those tonight. And it's a real pleasure to, to have you here, Claire. Um, I'm also going to introduce Jeff Blackwell, who's the historical group's treasurer and secretary. And Jeff will be managing the Q&A a little bit later on um, after Claire's formal presentation. So do post any questions or comments into the chat and we'll pick up with them later on. So Claire, it's a real pleasure to have you here and I'm going to hand over to you now. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Mike. And thanks for introduction and thanks for inviting me to talk to you all uh, this evening. So I'm really excited to share the highlights and guide you through selected collections from the National Science and Media Museum. So as Mike notes, my role is focused on archives and libraries. I'm a professional archivist and also a really big part of my role is creating and manage, managing access to our collections. And that's on site at the collection centre and the museum and also online. And plus doing things like this, coming out and giving presentations, such as my talk this evening, and just basically share the museum's fantastic collections as widely as possible. And I'm particularly delighted as the museum has got an ongoing, long-standing relationship with the RPS. Um, we cared for its collection from 2002 until it was transferred to the Victorian Albert Museum. And we also have a wonderful group of RPS volunteers who help us with cataloguing, currently the Tony Ray Jones archive. And I'll talk more about that later. And to start my usual disclaimer that I'm, I'm not a subject specialist in any of our collecting areas. I'm not a historian, I'm just a really inquisitive, passionate museum professional who has a real privilege to work with and share these great collections and have done throughout my career. So I'll be talking for about 45 minutes. So do post, put any questions you'd like answered later on to discuss in the chat. So to start with, with our museum. So the National Science and Music Media Museum is in right in the heart of Bradford. It opened in 1983 as the National Museum of Photography, Film, Television, and it had the first IMAX screen in the country. Then in 2007, it became the National Media Museum to encompass digital technology, and then relaunched as the National Science and Media Museum in 2017, with a really dedicated focus on STEM, so that's science, technology, engineering, and math, maths, in relation to sound and vision technologies. And at this time, it's a, it's a really exciting time for us in Bradford, and thanks to national lottery players, we've received initial support from a National Lottery Heritage Fund grant to build new galleries in our museum. And they'll be opening in winter 2024. And that's all part of a sort of redisplaying, a re-showing and reinterpreting our world-class collections of photography, film, television, and sound technologies. And that's all contributing towards Bradford bid to be City of Culture in 2025. And we find out who the winner is in May. So fingers crossed. And to give you a bit of an orientation of how we, we sit within uh, the Science Museum group. So our sister museums, the Science Museum and the bottom left there. And then up in the top left, we've got the National Air Museum in York and Science and Interesting Museum on the right there in Manchester and Locomotion up in Shildon. So we're part of this world leading group of science museums. We've got these unparalleled collections spanning STEM subjects, and we welcome millions of visitors every year. And a, a new enterprise for us, which is really important for storage and care of collections across the group, including ours for Bradford, is uh, the creation of a new storage facility, which you can just see there, which is the big building on the right, which is down at the National Collection Centre 
in Wiltshire, and that will house around 80% of the Science Museum's collections. And the building on the right is called Building One. It's absolutely huge. You could fit around 600 double-decker buses in there. And it's all primed and ready for collections. It's temperature controlled, and it's there for our long-term preservation and, and care of our collections. Other collections have come out of a very old building that you can see on the left, which is called Blythe House, and that's in West Kensington. And it was originally a post office savings bank, and it's been used as the main store for the Science Museum, the British Museum and the Victoria and Albert Museum until recent times. But it's no longer fit for purpose. And so hence this big project. And you can see two images in the middle there of the new store in Building One. And so the first objects to be transferred there were these very, very wonderful model ships. And then turning our attention uh, back to Bradford and back to our museum, which if you haven't visited, it's, it's a big museum. We've got seven floors of galleries and that includes permanent and temporary exhibitions. And we have three cinema screens, including the IMAX theatre. And it's really busy um, and really popular. And despite all of the restrictions and lockdowns, even last year, we welcomed uh, 139,000 visitors into our museum, which is great. And cinema particularly is really close to our hearts in Bradford. Bradford was the first UNESCO city of film. So you can see on the top left there, some uh, cinema goers enjoying a little trip to the movies. And also at the bottom, one of our galleries is called Wonder Lab, the red and black and white image you can see there, which looks at kind of experiences of the world and scientific kind of interactions. And you can see some children there having a wonderful time running around in the mirrored hall. And then top right uh, to talk about the Kodak Gallery, which is in our lower gallery of our museum. And that's all dedicated to the history of photography. And that's from the earliest paper negative right through to the digital age and image capture today. An the image there you can see on the right is a, a very local story to Bradford about um, one of the very most popular uh, photographic studios in the city, it's called Bellevue. And it was where everybody went to have their photographs set taken in the 20th century. And then we have a really, really active um, temporary exhibition program that changes a couple of times in the year. And the one that we've got at the moment, as you can see here, is called Top Secret. And it's been touring around all of the Science Museum sites and Bradford is the last, last place on the tour. And it explores the fantastic and interesting world of code breaking, ciphers and secret communications. And it includes the story of Alan Turing and his team of code breakers at Bletchley Park and uh, things like secrets of Soviet spy rings in Cold War Britain, and even today's modern day cybercrime networks. And we've worked really closely with GCHQ to borrow objects from them. You can see a motorcycle dispatch um, there and a radio, and also in, inter kind of interpreted with science museum objects as well. And that exhibition is on until June. So that's given you a, a good run through our museum and the Science Museum group. And now I'd like to focus in on, on collections and introduce you to our Collections and Research Centre, where I spend a lot of my time, which is on the lower floor of our museum. And this is where we store and look after the vast majority of the museum's collections. We have some large objects that you'll find down at the National Collection Centre. And down there, we've got nine environmentally controlled stores. Uh, housing millions of photographs, thousands of collections objects, and a reference library with a very extensive collection of books and periodicals. And all these collections and resources um, play into our focus to look at sound and vision media with an emphasis on photography, film, television, and sound technologies. So what you see there is basically the hub for all of our activity for caring for and providing access to collections. So there's a door there and on the right you can see our reading room. And to mention what actually happens in Insight. So it's, the main thing is storage, but also to care for collections as well. And so it's uh, open for research week, uh, third week of every month when anybody can book in and consult and enjoy and look at collections. 
Then we've got conservation and preservation. So colleagues there whose job it is to care for them. And if they need any remedial attention, any kind of, we've got an expert uh, photography conservator. You can see him in the images, image there, that's Vanessa Torres, who's a leading expert in photography conservation. It's a really busy place as well for volunteering. I mentioned our RPS volunteers. Um, we have volunteers who come in and help us repackage and do all sorts of work to care for our collections. And then exhibition and digitization and documentation work, all to make sure that the collections are cared for and the information about them is shared online and in person with everyone wants to come and see them. At the moment, we're slightly restricted with COVID safe working, but I'm look, it's looking like it's going to be changing quite soon. So we can go back to inviting groups to come in for workshops, events and tours. And that's um, a big part of my role. So I'm excited about that happening again. And now to look at the collections in more detail with you. So the collections are incredibly rich and diverse and of national and international significance. And even the few objects and archives shown here on this slide really do offer multiple wide ranging, inspiring, unique stories. And these are things that I've um, I've talked about, that colleagues have talked about in the last couple of months. So the topics you see here include uh, early photography, finding queer histories in our collections, looking at film makeup before CGI, um, mixing coals consoles for live music, and TV development and monitoring the 1970s through to particular fashion genres and fashion photography genres and photo journalism. So it's all these things and more that we care for and share with, with you as I am this evening and with all of our visitors. So I'd like to look at our TV collecting area with you as the first collecting area to talk about this evening. So the museum's collection includes a, a vast TV and broadcast collection. Objects include cameras from the birth of television, television student at Alexandra Palace, objects that heralded ITV and BBC Two and then colour broadcasting, and then television receivers that span the history of TV and then groundbreaking technologies like um, phonovision. And a key figure, and you can see him here on the left for television history is John Logie Baird. He was a Scottish inventor who created the apparatus which successfully transmitted the first true television picture in 1925. You can see it's there, the double eight apparatus. So this is part of our collections. It's a key object and it was made by Baird in his, his London studio with things that were around him and available at the time. It'd be things like it's got um, motors, um, batteries, there's a piece of a hat box there, that circular item that you can see there. And then the little ventriloquist dummy on the end is, uh, was named Stooky Bill by Loki Baird. And he's seen as the first TV actor as Baird couldn't use lighting on a human being to light up to be able to capture the image that had to use the um, ventriloquist dummy. So the device seen here is from a really early period of Baird's experimental work during which he was able to just show simple shapes. And he really famously demonstrated this at the um, Selfridges store in London. And it came to the Science Museum Group and was donated by him to the Science Museum Group in 1926. So kind of why is this important? Um, we know that Baird's approach was actually abandoned in favour of Marconi EMI, and the BBC selected Marconi to deliver its high definition television in 1936. Um, however, while Bayard may not have invented TV as you, you see and know it today, his work and demonstrations raised awareness about the possibility of television as a medium for all sorts of things, for enjoyment, education and communication, and hence why it's got a really, really important place in our collections at Bradford. And then on to our sound technologies collection. Uh, which has been developed in recent years by our colleague Annie Jameson, who's our curator of sound technologies. And she's built up this incredible holding from everything from mixing desks to microphones to Marshall stacks. So I've got the, uh, the pleasure of talking about two really important sound objects with you this evening. First of all, the object on the left, uh, which is a Fairlight CMI, and that's for, for computer musical instrument. And this was the first commercially available digital synthesizer. 
and that could sample and take in acoustic instruments and kind of capture and generate digital music. So this was a completely new game changer for how um, music could be generated and the likes of Peter Gabriel, um, he owned the first CMI in the UK and was the first musician to release an album featuring these sounds. And he was assisted by Peter Vogel, one of the Fairlight's designers, and um, it was just a pioneering uh, development for music. And so we acquired this Fairlight you can see here in 2017, and it was kindly donation, donated by the musician and producer Robin Scott, who you might know from um, the music project M, and they had a, a pop single that is uh, in the chart since 1979 called Pop Music. And it's thanks to him that we have this great object in our collections. Now, alongside, you can see the Midas XL3, and that's a 40 channel live performance console that dates from 1990. So what a mixing console do, does is allow multiple instruments and voices and sounds to be blended on stage and balanced by a mixing engineer to create a really good sound for a crowd at a live, live show. So if you've been to a gig or a concert, it's highly likely that a successor of Midas XL3 has made it a great night out because of the excellent sound that you've heard. So this particular model was a turning point in the development of analog mixing consoles for live music and established the Midas as the leading live console manufacturer for the next two decades. Uh, this one we bought from the manufacturer in 1990. Um, it had been used by John Tinline of Encore PA and used by lots of well-known artists and engineers, uh, the likes of James Brown at Wembley Stadium, The Who, um, Madness, Motorhead, and then more recently James Morrison and The Prodigy. And I think for this particular object, if only it could speak, I think the stories that it could tell would be fantastic. And then looking at our cinematography uh, collections, which are really varied and really strong, from cameras to archives and so much more. Um, and so what I'd like to share with you this evening is um, highlight, which is the Ashton and Leakey collection. Uh, Roy Ashton and Phil e Leakey were master makeup artists who worked on many of the British cult horror films in 20th century. Um, a trained artist, Aston, began his career actually um, in the Garment British Film Corporation as a means of kind of supplementing an opera singing career. But then he gave that up to become a full time makeup artist. And they're really well known for their work on the Hammer Horror films. And Phil Leakey was the first person to be credited with um, a special makeup effects award. And the collection, this is just highlights here that I'll go through in a minute, is absolutely fantastic. And it gives an insight into what was really at that time, a largely DIY, hands-on, very practical approach to making prosthetics and makeup for feature films. So it includes pencil sketches, photographs, prostheses, um, sculptures, makeups that they actually used. And it's a really special collection. It dates from about 1945 until about 1980. So just looking at the images with you, uh, you can see on the left a pair of fake fangs that were made for Christopher Lee um, to wear in one of the, the Dracula films. And there'd be a file of fake blood um, that he would then press with his tongue and the, the blood would pour out. And you can see him in the middle there in The Curse of Frankenstein, made up as, as the creature. And that's a great photograph by John Jay, the photographer. And then in the end, uh, one of the original kits that they would have had and taken on site, that's Phil Leakey's. And so that's uh, an insight into the kind of things that he'd have had at his elbow to, to touch up makeup and to, to add makeup. And then through to our photography collection, I'm gonna spend um, a bit more time than the other collecting areas on photography because it is so strong for us in, in Bradford. Um, we really have every permutation of photography and photographic practice represented in our collections, really from the dawn of photography right through to digital image capture in the world that we live in today. So I'll start by talking about the earliest days of photography and William Henry Fox Talbot. He remains one of the most important figures in the history and development of photography. He was born in 1800 
He's a man of many talents with a deep knowledge of science and really inventive spirit. And his kind of quest to understand nature and also to enhance his own drawing, shall I say, he developed um, photogenic drawings in 1934, mainly of local life to his native Wiltshire. And then improving on these, he began experimenting with early cameras. And you can see a replica of one of them here on the slide. And then moving on to creating the world's first neg negative. It's an image of a window at Laycock Abbey where he lived in 1835. So his collection um, houses much of his groundbreaking and unique material, including this first negative. In addition to around, we have around 5,000 of his early photogenic drawings and color types and salt prints. Collection also includes publications such as the Pencil of Nature, and that was the first commercially published book of photographic illustrations. And we also have lots of his original notes and correspondence. And just to mention the, the salt print you can see there, that's one of my favourites um, from the Fox Talbot collection, which is an effigy, an image of an effigy of Sir Walter Scott's dog, Mida, and that dates from 1844. And that was published in some pictures in Scotland in 1845. And then moving on to another one of our really significant collections, which is the, the Kodak Museum collection which spans the history of photography and cinematography from its very, very early beginnings in kind of silhouettes and daguerreotypes through to modern film and portable colour cameras. The Kodak Museum was established in 1927 at the Kodak factory in Harrow and collected a vast array of photographs documenting everything, everything from war to fashion to art, astronomy, nature, industry and everything of everyday life. The collection's cameras and photographic equipment chronicled the development of cameras and photographic apparatus, such as early lensing equipment, roll films and video cameras. In 1985, the collection was relocated to us at the National Science and Media Museum, where it's been ever since. And today the collection contains over 50,000 photographs dating from the early 1920s right through to present day and over 10,000 objects and you can see many of the highlights of those in our, our Kodak gallery. And we're really representing this collection with early photography formats. So the things like the daguerreotypes, amber types, tin types, and many carte de visites and cabinet cards. So a couple of things I've collected here again, a couple of my favorites I think you'll enjoy. The image on the left will be familiar. That's the one that we used to promote this event. And that's a hand colored stereoscopic daguerreotype of a young woman taken in the studio of Claude, Antoine Claudette in about 1853. Um, Claudette was born in Lyon in France and he moved to London in 1829 and became one of the first importers of daguerreotypes and cameras from France and opened his own photographic studio in 1841 and was the first person to introduce painted studio black cloth. And I just think this is a really beautiful image. It's slightly less formal than some of the images you'll see from this period because the women look slightly more relaxed. It's beautiful colouring. And then whizzing forward, we have this um, Tessina um, camera made by Concava in Switzerland in, in the 1960s. And so this has got um, 25, a 35 millimetre film that runs horizontally through the camera. And I just love it because this is actually in our top secret exhibition and uh, I can't imagine the spy who would wear this because it's quite a large watch so they must have had very very long sleeves to cover it over to do covert surveillance and take photographs. So moving on from the Kodak Museum collection through on the, to one of our really significant um, newspaper archive collections which is a daily Herald archive um, from the 1930s to the 1960s, the Daily Herald was the world's top selling newspaper. And the Daily Herald archive is the newspaper's in-house picture library. And we hold 200 of the original filing cabinets. You can see them there, these, these green filing cabinets that contain, we think about 3 million original photographs housing that library that the newspaper generated. And they date from 1911 when the new newspaper was established up until the 1960s. Now the Herald was at its very heart a socialist paper and it began life as a, street, a strike sheet in London 
um, through the printing union strikes in January 1911. And once the fight for better pay had been, been fought and reduced hours, uh, it closed it door, its doors. But then the Labour Party supported it and it reopened in 1912. And the writers from the newspaper voiced views and encouraged debates on mostly socialist topics. Uh, this included things like women's suffrage and independence for, for India. And so it became very successful and it was the first paper to reach a two million circulation. Uh, but it did always slightly struggle with its profile and it went into decline in the 1950s and 60s. And in 1964, it relaunched as The Sun, as we know today, with the slogan, a paper born of the age we live in. But despite an initial upsurge in sales, it all declined again. And it uh, was then sold off to Rupert Murdoch to News International in 1969 and became The Sun that we know today. So it came, this collection came to us from the National Portrait Gallery to the National Science and Media Museum in 1983. And as I said, we, we think we've got about three million photographs and it covers everything. It's got the First World War coverage, um, the rise of, rise of trade unionism, major sporting and artistic and scientific developments, the everyday person to the most famous person. They're all there. And I just chose this one image, it was very hard to do, um, of this, this woman at agricultural show in the 1940s um, holding a huge cabbage. And uh, just to mention as well, in addition to prints, we also within this collection have thousands of glass plate negatives. And just to mention, many of these didn't need to, didn't go into print in newspapers. Um, you'll find the printed versions in the newspaper archive online, but a lot of these are unique. And uh, the Nin House photographers were also famous names, including the likes of, of James Charchet. So it's a, it's a wonderful collection. And then looking at um, next of our significant photography collections is the Howard and Jane Ricketts collection, who were pioneers of photography collecting in Britain. And they were collected privately and we acquired their collection for the museum in 1990. So their collection focuses mainly on British 19th century photography, particularly the first 50 years after its invention, with works by the likes of Jabez Hogg and Francis Frith, Hill and Adamson and Herbert Ponting. And the types of photography range from kind of the ethnographic to the topographic to, to portraiture. It's really broad. Uh, the Ricketts collection contains early photography formats, again, um, similar to the Kodak Museum collection of amber types, daguerreotypes, uh, but also lots of, of photographic albums, uh, particularly snapshot, al snapshot albums, and then um, some photographic objects, including magic lanterns. It's also broken down into very distinct collections. This includes the Herbert G. Stewart archive with its very re revealing set of 22 albums of members of the Russian royal family. And they were taken between 1909 and the um, start of the Russian revolution. So you can see an image here from one of the family snapshot albums, which shows our Nicholas II with mem members of the Russian royal family. And um, just to mention that our, our collections are shown in Bradford, but also elsewhere, including at the Science Museum. And these albums were a key feature of the last Tsar exhibition that happened at the Science Museum in 2019, which, which looked at the, the world and the life of the Russian royal family. And then looking at, um, again, another collection, but this time generated by an individual. This is the Andor Kresner Krauss collection and the Focal Press Archive. Uh, Andor Kresner Krauss was one of the most important and influential influential figures in photographic publishing in the 20th century. Um, Andor, Andor Krasner Krauss, also known as KK to his friends, was born in Hungary in 1909. And as a young man, he studied photography and cinematography in Munich, where he met the publisher Wilhelm Knapp. And he built a really successful career writing for trade journals. But then at the outbreak of um, the war and the rise of the Nazis in 1937, he came to Britain as a refugee. And the very next year, he founded Focal Press, which was a specialist publishing house um, focusing on photography. And it was an overnight success. And it went on to be one of the world's leading publishers of books about photography and the music, moving image. And during his lifetime, Focal Press published over 
1,200 book titles all over the world, selling incredible 50 million copies. And he had his finger on the pulse about all design aspects until he retired in 1979. And then on his death in 1989, he very generously uh, donated his personal archive and his personal extensive library, which is over seven or several thousand volumes to, to our museum. And that was available freely for study. So in terms of what it comprises, um, there's a focal press library of publications which the publishing house published. Um, there's also uh, a great selection of photographs which were published by Focal Press. And there's a really lovely example here that I particularly liked, like by Brassai of Hotel Dieu scene in, in Paris in 1933, which is extremely atmospheric. We also have his, his own personal archive, which gives an insight to his, his, his life and passions. There are personal papers, his travel documents, uh, correspondence, even his cameras. And also the correspondence, uh, interestingly, includes personal letters that he wrote in the Second World War with institutions such as, such as the um, British Intelligence, um, Naval Division and the BBC, talking about things such as national service enrolment, photography, food rations and even translations of German texts. So it, it's an incredibly rich collection about photographic publishing, but also as an individual and our Kresner Krause's life and work. Our next collection I'd like to talk to you about uh, sort of dips into commercial photography. Uh, the Zoltan Glass archive. Zoltan Glass was one of the great commercial photographers of the 20th century and automobiles were one of his favorite subjects. And during the 1920s and 1930s, he was commissioned by Dame Le Benz to make uh, photographs of the Mercedes Benz vehicles. And uh, you can see a really great example at the top there. Uh, he documented the period of the classic Silver Arrow cars, uh, which dominated international Grand Prix racing from the 19, early 1934 onwards. And he was really skillful at making kind of um, uh, factory-based automobile production look like quite gr glamorous and really great for publicity materials. And he was really successful, uh, but so, so, similarly to Andor Krenzer Krauss, he had to flee uh, Germany in 1936, um, basically because he couldn't, he couldn't work anymore. And he emigrated to London and he became a British citizen in 1948. And he continued with his photography passion, but then moving into advertising. And he uh, made photographs for titles, including Lilliput and illustrated magazines. And you can see an example here of some fashion photography from the 1950s. And he was also known for taking celebrity photographs in the era before um, social media that we know now, and also nude photography as well. So this collection came to our museum in 1981 when he died. And it's a, it's a fantastically vast collection as well. It includes around um, thousands of negatives, contacts and ephemera by glass dating from 1930 to 1970. And all these topics are in there, the pre-war German motor industry, pre-war British advertising, and then the two titles there, Lilliput and Illustrated. And also for the Mercedes-Benz photographs, we digitised around 6,000 of those a few years ago. They date from the 1930s, so you can find those online. And then to talk about um, the work of, of Tony Ray Jones, who was um, a British photographer who died very prematurely at the age of 31 in 1972. Now his work was very influential on the development of British documentary art photography and it continues to be influential today uh, with the likes of Martin Parr championing his work. And what he did was kind of hold a magnifying glass up to society and culture with great sensitivity and, and looking at an anthropological, anthropological side to uh, particularly British life. He also worked in the UK, USA as well. Now his collection is extensive and, and includes primary resources, um, photographic materials, including his um, uh, photographic prints. We've got about 700 of those, um, 1700 35 millimeter rolls of film, uh, over 2000 black and white contact sheets, 
and many other items that he used to create his work throughout his life. And we're really uh, grateful, as I mentioned at the start of my talk, that we've got a group of RPS volunteers who are helping us catalogue that collection, um, which means it'll be so much more accessible in the future and more people can enjoy it. And now thinking a bit more um, kind of locally and, and how Bradford plays into our collections. So the Shelter Archive of Photographs by Nick Hedges consists of two sets of uh, about 964 photographs which are commissioned by Shelter. And that's a UK charity that campaigns to end homelessness and bad housing in Great Britain. And they were taken by Nick Hedges between 1968 and 1972. And the photographs document poor housing conditions and the lives of people living in slums and properties deemed unfit for human habitation across Britain at this time. And Hedges travelled all across Britain for this project with Shelter. And it depicts depict cities um, including Glasgow, Leeds, Manchester, Sheffield, Birmingham, and also importantly for us, Bradford as well. You can see an image there of a back alley in Bradford. And um, these, these sets are accompanied by captions that were drafted by Hedges himself, noting the subjects and details of their lives. So it's really important to us to keep this local aspect to our collecting uh, when thinking about building our photographic collections. Next, I'd just like to talk about fashion photography and the work of Shirley Beljean, whose um, collection has recently come to us. She's very kindly um, given it to our, our collection at Bradford. Now, Shirley, if you haven't come across before, is a celebrated fashion photographer. She mainly worked in the 1970s and 1980s in the UK on fashion shoots. And um, she used a number of different camera formats. And there's a real richness to the makeup of her photo studio. So in our collecting for Shirley Beljean's collection, it includes her original photographs that you can see here, along with objects that helped her make her work. So her Hasselblad camera, and there's a really great image there on the left of Shirley at work at a photo shoot. And she often shot from kind of the waist and that gave her a very distinctive kind of look to her photographs. Then a really lovely image in the mid mid middle, a cibachrome by Shirley, a fashion shoot, a cibachrome that's from the 1980s as well. So bringing her work into our collection was really important to look at that aspect of fashion photography um, for the 70s and 1980s. And we're really lucky um, to have the Impressions Gallery collection um, within our holdings. Uh, the Impressions Gallery is just across the road from us in Bradford, and we hold its incredible archive that documents its history, comprising hundreds of works by artists who have shown there since Impressions opened. Impressions Gallery was originally opened in York in 1972 and then later moved over to Bradford and it was one of the first specialist photography galleries in the country and has played a vital role in changing the way we think about photography and it continues to support and encourage groundbreaking breaking artists who challenge and change uh, perspectives on photography. And we recently catalogued uh, much of the Impressions Gallery archive with a dedicated group of volunteers. And so you can find information about that online. And so it's a vast collection. And I, I thought, what could I choose for you this evening? So I thought I'd speak to two images uh, that kind of have a relationship with the times that we live in. Uh, so on the left, you see there's a, a print depicting Margaret Thatcher, the then Conservative Prime Minister from 1979 to 1980 with Mikhail Gorbachev, uh, the final leader of the Soviet Union. And that was when Margaret Thatcher had visited um, the Soviet Union in 1987, when there was a warming of relationships between the West uh, and with Russia. And then on the right is an incredible photograph by the photographer Kenneth Jarshek that uh, was taken in the Gulf War in 1991. And that was exhibited at the Impressions Gallery in an exhibition called Gulf TV, The Real War in um, October, 1992. 
Uh, if you're not familiar with Josh Eck's work, he, the, the very brutally honest photographs that he took in the Gulf War. There's one particular photograph of uh, showing a dead uh, Iraqi soldier that you can find online that was taken in 1991. And that was at first regarded by many newspaper editors as being far too disturbing to print, but later became one of the most famous images of the Gulf War. And just to quickly quote Jashek, he says, if I don't photograph this, people like my mum will think this war is what they just see on TV. And that was the entire premise for the exhibition at Impressions at the time. And to finish our uh, look through uh, photography collecting, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about collecting in a digital age. So collecting photography in the digital world is quite a big challenge. It requires new ways to store and take care of digital images, as well as new approaches from us as archivists and curators deciding what should be collected. And we're starting to collect more objects to help us tell the story of how digital photography comes into existence and how it's used in the world. And so example on the right um, is the two um, active pixel sensors. They look like brass jellyfish, don't they? And they are part of the um, Pixel Pioneer archive of Peter Noble. And he was one of the first people to make attempts to capture an image on a microchip. So we're, we're really fortunate to have his personal papers, photographs and sensors as all part of this charting of his pioneering work. We're also working to capture use of digital images in social media. And you can see the image on the left and you may have seen this meme that was created and tweeted by the Museum of English Rural Life in 2017. And so led by our former curator of photography, Philip Roberts, in close collaboration with Dr. Aaron Rees of the University of Leeds, uh, an expert in museums and digital collecting, uh, we collected this meme in 2022. And so why did we do this? Uh, because this particular meme tells a story about the different affordances of photography and photographic technology. So the original photograph is analogue of this particular sheep and it sits in the collection of the Museum of English Rural Life. And then it was taken by that museum's social media uh, team and posted online and became um, a social media object. And then people interacted with it and it became incredibly popular and it's been retweeted around um, 30,000 times and we've got a range of responses from many people, including uh, somebody in the news now, Elon Musk, who's a Tesla founder. So this was really important to us to, to collect and to build up that story of how digital technologies are used in images online and in social media. So that concludes my introduction and looking through our vast and incredible collections. If you would like to find out more, we've got our online website, which gives information about collections, there's blogs and all sorts of things on there. And now I hand over to you all to ask me some questions. Thank you. Claire, thank you so much for that. Um, before I offer you some formal thanks, can I invite questions? Um, whilst people are thinking about it, can I ask you the question that probably all curators dread? What is your favourite item in the collection? You mentioned well, your print. But, uh, yeah, I, I've got a new favourite, uh, and um, it's all thanks to Sarah Dominici of the University of Westminster, who came to the museum uh, last month to look at new pho um, photographic technologies in terms of dark rooms in the 19th century. And she asked me to get out a portable development developing tent, which was in a little mahogany box. And we opened it up and it contained this beautiful scarlet tent. And I've never seen anything like it. So it's dating for about 1890. And so you propped it up on little brass plop, props and then it had a viewing sort of two little eye holes. So you could view as you had your collodion plates and all of your chemicals in there and it's it's just incredible uh, and that was quite a new discovery for us that was um it is part of the Kodak Museum collection and I don't think it'd been looked at before and so for Sarah's work around dark rooms in the late 19th century when we when she I think thought we all thought that you just have black material for your portable development tent when you were off on the grand tour 
uh, it turns out this was a very different object and it was just really exciting. Um, and so that is my current favourite thing, Jeff, but it could change next week because there could be a researcher comes in who sees something else and then I'll just hop on it and go, no, I like that now. But yeah, that's the thing at the moment. I suppose that's one of the privileges of being where you are. There Completely. Won't other, there won't be other questions coming in on chat at the moment, so I'm going to um, use the opportunity to ask you something else. The, you mentioned the Daily Herald collection and you showed a photograph of a lady with a cabbage. It looked as though it had been marked up by a photographer or, or an editor before use. In addition to the copies of the newspaper that, you, that probably form the basis of the archive, do you have a lot of other documentation that, that uh, represents the work that was going on behind the scenes, the editorial work? Uh, we, it tends to be what you referenced there, that the hand of the editor is in the masking, it's in whatever annotations you see and we don't have correspondence or anything we have it are photographs of the staff of the Daily Herald but the thing that we do have um, that tells a lot about particularly the photographers working on the Herald is what they call the day books so they'd write in there when a job came up that they'd write in the photographer's name where they were sent to um, what the subject was etc that gives the day books if you look through those that gives a real sense of what jobs they were going to, what was in the news at the time, who the photographers were, like I mentioned, James Yarshay. So that's where we tend to get the sense of the activity of the newspaper and the photographic team. But the editorial desk is just found in the pen marks that you see on thousands of the photographs in, in the newspaper archive. But what you can do is, thanks to the online British newspaper archive, is that you can put in the date, if you find a print in the newspaper archive with us, you can put in that information, say a date into the online search engine and find the final copy, the final version of what the article looked at like. And I've done that before. So you can see how the original photograph, what bit of it was actually, the markup was correct. So they only wanted a head and shoulders shot, something like that. And that's what originally pl played out into the newspaper. So that's how you can kind of link the two together. Thank you. We've got a question just come in from Hilary Reid. The chair of the group, in addition to thanking you for the talk, she's asking if you have any material on Walter Woodbury, and in particular his correspondence from Australia. I'm not sure that we do, but I will certainly look it up for you. Um, Walter Woodbury. If I can get back to you on that, once that's I've had a look at our, our collections, it's not a name that's that's familiar, but then again, it could be there. So, yeah, if you bear with me, thank you. Thank you. And a question coming in now, again, thank you for the talk, but are all the collections moving to Wiltshire? Or if not, does the no. SNLM website say where the collections can be seen? Yeah, is, so Wiltshire's just off site storage, is it? Yes, yes, it is. So the Wiltshire store is called the National Collection Centre, and that will house the vast majority of the Science Museum collections. So, you know, the, the building I showed you that's Blythe House, that's uh, being basically everything's coming out of there, all the collections. They'll go, the vast majority of Science Museum collections will live in Wiltshire. For us in, in Bradford, our collections stay where they are. It's just larger objects. For example, in Wiltshire, we have our TV detector van, which we couldn't possibly house uh, in the collection centre at Bradford. And there are other larger objects like large cameras that again would go to Wiltshire from the Bradford collections. But anything like the photographs that I've talked about tonight, the cinematography collections, television collections, etc., cetera, um, they're not gonna go anywhere. It's just where it's something a, it's, it's large and we simply can't hold it because of lack of space or if it's something that needs conservation and preservation because there are specialist teams down there who look at objects and care for objects. So it could be it makes a temporary trip down to Wiltshire to be cared for and then comes back to us. Thank you. There don't appear to be any more questions coming in at the moment. So okay. perhaps I can ask you just one final question. Mm -hmm. You, you mentioned the, the Hedges archive. Do you have any ongoing engagement with the community in Bradford? 
Yes, uh, we do. At the moment, um, again, it's around the Daily Herald archive. We're doing a project which we've called Communities and Crowds. And that's um, all about the community leading, interpreting and selecting um, material from our collections. And it's the, the Caribbean community in Bradford who have been looking at that collection. Their volunteers have come in every week and they're digitizing them. So they're learning to scan and they're cataloging them and basically looking at the collections in a way that, that we never would. And it's really exciting. them going to be blogging and sharing that information on our website. So that's one way. And then in terms of volunteering, it's local volunteers who, who really help us with our collections, particularly to create access to them and care for them. So there's that relationship there as well um, that we're really lucky to have. And that's volunteering, not just with our collections, but things like our festivals, um, with events and all sorts of things. And it's just thanks to the people of Bradford that we can do these things because they come forward and volunteer. So in lots of different ways, really. Thank you. At that point, Claire, I'm going to say on behalf of the RPS Historical Group, thank you so much for a superb tour around the facility. You've made thank me you. realise just how much I've missed visits to Bradford. <laughs> well, you're welcome any time. <laughs> thank you so much. You're really welcome. Nice, nice to meet you all. Thanks for your time. Thank you again. Okay. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye now.